morning. Good morning, everybody. And thank you very much for the very kind introduction. Um, I am very honored and humbled to be the first speaker of your webinar series entitled Beyond Porshinkula. So the topic, uh, the title which I chose um, from the theme provided by the organizing committee is Curing Bodies, Saving Souls, Franciscan Legacies to the Philippine Church and Nation from 1578 to 1898. So by way of introduction, I would like to give a very brief history of the Franciscans in the Philippines. Next slide, please. So the, the Franciscans, the Order of Friar, Friars Minor, OFM, is the second religious order to arrive in the Philippines on June 24, 1578. Unfortunately, there are still many things that a popular history does not accurately represent. And one of them is that the Franciscans are always regarded as part of those that would have extensive friar lands. But that is not true because the Franciscan order is a mendicant order and would have uh, taken very seriously the vow of poverty. So they have no property. They are the only religious order of the five uh, pioneering religious orders to arrive during the Spanish colonial period. They are the only one without any property, even uh, to their order. No? I will explain this later on as I go uh, through the rest of my presentation. Some of the most important contributions of the Franciscans to Philippine history and culture would be the reduction or the resettlement of the natives, which is, of course, the whole idea, no? the, uh, which is, of course, the, whole, the, the idea of the very famous missionary, Reverend Father Juan de Placencia. Um, resettlement would enable the natives to be, set, uh, to be um, uh, concentrated in a specific area and which would enable them to receive um, instructions in Catholic education and would facilitate conversion and evangelization. So the reduction also gave rise to the pueblos, um, which of course would have uh, the important features of the church and eventually the schools. Uh, um, aside from this, Franciscan missionaries are well known uh, in history to have, in, in Philippine church history, uh, to have constructed roads, uh, especially in the area of Laguna, Tila, Lumban, no? and the bridges, the bridges in Tayabas, in Quezon, that still exist up to the present. And of course, the famous printing press, uh, which is responsible for having uh, uh, presented or published many important tomes in the history of printing in the Philippines. Franciscans were also responsible for teaching music to the children to teach them how to, um, how to play instruments, to sing, to chant. No? They have also been responsible for writing uh, many important books such as catechism books, the vocabularios, grammaticas, or diccionarios. And of course, they have written many other works in history and ethnography. However, I do not intend to discuss all of this, but I would like to concentrate only on three items. Next slide, please. So these are the legacies which I would discuss this morning. First would be the hospitals founded by the Order of Friars Minor in the Philippines. And then this would be um, very closely associated with the practice of medicine and surgery, as well as the practice of pharmacy. Next slide, please. These are the hospitals founded by the Franciscans from 1578 to 1603. And these are some of the most important, no? Actually the first is the most important, but I will reserve the best for last and discuss this later. So I will start with a discussion of the Hospital de San Diego de Alcala in Camarines. Next slide, please. So the Hospital de San Diego de Alcala was founded by a very well-known, uh, one of the guardians, no? the, the guardian at that time of the Franciscans, Reverend Father Jeronimo de Aguilar in 1586. This is located in Naga, today in uh, Camarines, 
Uh, and the land was actually donated by Spanish citizens who felt that there was a very important need to have a hospital, especially a hospital that was going to be uh, dedicated to the care of those people afflicted with leprosy, which eventually resulted in its being more popularly known as the Hospital de San Lazaro. Um, the land was planted to coconuts, which yielded oil, wine, and vinegar that would uh, help make the, the hospital financially uh, sustainable and independent. It also began to produce rice and eventually other lands were donated by Spanish uh, citizens that uh, would raise livestock that would um, contribute to the food supply of the hospital as well as generate income. However, in 1623, um, it was turned over to the diocese no, for reasons that I still have not been able to clearly find out, but it was already, the edifice of the hospital was already uh, finished with bricks. And so therefore it was no longer made of wood or made of light materials such as nipa or bamboo. 40 years later, it was destroyed by a typhoon. Um, it was of course rebuilt, but then um, it still was under the diocese, meaning the Bishop of Nueva Cáceres was directly in charge of it, not the Franciscans, but in 1773, it was returned to the Franciscans. However, by the middle of the 19th century, there is no more trace of the hospital, not even in the records. So this is another area for research. No? Next slide, please. The next hospital founded by the Franciscans would be the Hospital del Espiritu Santo by the very, very famous doctor surgeon, Fray Diego de Santa Maria, a Franciscan brother in 1591. It is called Hospital del Espiritu Santo because it was founded or it opened its doors to patients uh, in the, during the feast of the Pentecost. He, he is also responsible, Fray Diego de Santa Maria, is also responsible for having founded other hospitals, uh, which I would mention later on, but this Hospital del Espiritu Santo is the first hospital founded by a religious order in Cavite, Puerto. The land was donated by a Spaniard, Don Felipe Correo, who would be uh, followed by other Spaniards who would donate. No? So these donations are very important because the hospitals are always in need of money because they do not charge anything. Everything would be free, the services, the medicines, the benefits. In 1608, it was enlarged, it was expanded and then made of stone. And uh, this hospital would be um, specifically for all the Navy personnel because the Navy, uh, the Navy personnel would be concentrated in Cavite Puerto and therefore, uh, there would be a lot of other people aside from those actively serving in the Navy. There would be carpenters, there would be uh, masons, there would be uh, people who would be in charge of loading the goods for the galleons. No? So there is a lot of activity and the hospital is very much needed. However, in 1642, uh, because of um, overzealousness, the governor general of the Philippines at that time who was Sebastian Hurtado de Corcuera, violently forced out the Franciscans from this hospital. But the king ordered the hospital to be returned to the Franciscans the next year, but it did not really happen, uh, actually happen until 1645 because the order from Spain would arrive in the Philippines only after two or three years. The average time that it takes for a letter to come or an order from Spain to arrive in the Philippines was about three years. Now in 1663, 1663, unfortunately, it was ordered destroyed by another governor general at that time, Governor Sabiniano Manrique de Lara, because it was supposed to be, uh, it is made of stone, it is made of uh, robust materials, and he ordered all buildings around Manila Bay to be destroyed in order that the Chinese Corsair Cosinga would not be able to use these materials in order to construct defense, defenses 
when uh, they would attack Manila. So this is a very poor decision, but that was what happened. So this hospital ceased to exist. No? Next slide, please. I would like to show a map of uh, Cavite Puerto in 1663. And the arrow that you can see in the center points to the Franciscan convent, church, hospital, the pharmacy, and others. The next slide, please, will uh, show us a very a larger portion of this. And you can see the name very clearly, San Francisco, right there within that rectangular yellow box. And you can see that the church tower is on the right side. And so you can presume that that entire portion is the church. And one of these um, horizontal hallways would be definitely the hospital. And further away would be the convent, the storerooms, the pharmacy, the kitchen, etc. cetera. No? So that gives us some idea of what this hospital looked like, or at least the building looked like, because nothing exists there anymore. This is now part of the Philippine Navy um, uh, base in the city of Cavite. And there is nothing there that would tell us that this is a former hospital of the Franciscans. Next slide, please. So the next hospital is another famous one. Actually, the hospitals of the Franciscans are very famous. We're very famous at that time. Oh, the Hospital de Agua Santas, which was founded by the same uh, Fray Diego de Santa Maria within Mainit, now referred to as Los Baños in Laguna in the year 1602. Actually, even before its foundation, San Pedro Bautista was there and he actually saw the very, very uh, positive effects of the hot natural springs of the area and recommended no, that something be done about it, which is the reason why the Franciscan order petitioned the government, the royal government, the king, for permission to establish the hospital. And actually, they were successful. So in 1602, um, the king uh, gave the order uh, or in the permission, which was uh, which was approved by the Cabildo in Manila, and then, of course, confirmed by the Governor General. So uh, in 1608, April 4, specifically, a donation of land was made by several natives. So you see, this is a little bit different from the other two hospitals that I have mentioned previously, because these are natives who donated the land for the actual hospital and the other lands, which will be used in order to help the hospital um, sustain itself so that it would become financially independent. It became a two-story wooden hospital, no? but it is made of hardwood in 1614, which also included a chapel, a convent, the convent, and the offices. There were also balenarios, no? balenarios, no? these are bathhouses, not just the hospital. So there are outlying buildings where women would have one specific uh, wing uh, where they would, be, they would have individual bath cells so that they can, uh, the, the waters would flow naturally, the hot waters would flow naturally into the cells so that uh, they can they can uh, take a bath in privacy, no? with privacy. And then there's a separate uh, wing for the men. Um, in 1634, again, just like the other, what happened to the other hospitals, the crown took over uh, the hospital, but the chaplain who was a Franciscan was retained, but, uh, but hardly, hardly given any, um, any means to be able to sustain himself. I believe that he was given only 10 pesos per month, which is so little actually. And yet the chaplain persisted. Many years after that in 1737, April 17, the hospital was raised to the ground by fire. So the hospital was not functioning anymore. However, the balinarios or the bus continued to service the community or and all those who have come from many, many far away areas, particularly specifically 
to benefit from the healthful effects of the natural springs. 50 years after that, in 1787, a French chemist analyzed the waters in uh, Los Baños, and he found out that it contained magnesium. It also had a certain uh, level of iron and uh, sodium, which uh, explained to, at that time, he, the, the chemist explains, which explains partially why the hot waters would be really beneficial. In 1790, the church was reconstructed, but not the hospital. It would take almost 100 years more, no? What, what, at least um, about 80 years more for the hospital to be reconstructed in, in, at a very late time in 1877. And only because the governor general of the Philippines at that time, who was Domingo Moriones, was able to benefit from the effects of the natural hot springs. The uh, Franciscan order actually gave up the administration of the hospital. And today, very little remains in the area. Next slide, please. So here, I would like to show you the 1602 document, the first page of the 1602 document, which is from the Archivo Franciscano Ibero Americano in Madrid, where you can see the signature of Fa Fra Father Blas de San Diego in the lower uh, right side, where he uh, informs the governor of Laguna province of uh, the approval of the king to establish the hospital. Next slide, please. Now, the second, uh, uh, the second page of the folio, this is an entire folder, is uh, the, the first part of the confirmation of the Cabildo as well as the confirmation or approval of Governor General Pedro de Acuna. Next one, please. So here you can see the arrow, the blue arrow, which points to the actual signature of Governor General or Don Pedro de Acuna. So you can see, I don't think it is every day that we are able to see the signatures of the Governor Generals. And so this is, I think, a very good opportunity to enable us to become familiar with at least the signature. Next slide, please. Now, this one is very interesting because it is, uh, it is the, the copy, the last page of the donation of uh, land to the Hospital de Agua Santas by two natives, by two Indios. No? And you can see the arrow on the lower left side, which points to two signatures. No? And if you can see uh, higher up, you would have uh, the name Bartolome Alison. That's the first, the first uh, signature says Bartolome Alison. And uh, then the second signature, would be Andres Duarte. So these are the two donors, no? And this is in by buy-in. They actually said in this document that they don't know how to sign in the Spanish uh, writing system or the Latin alphabet. So they would sign in the by buy-in, which, which means that even up to that time, it had been preserved and natives were still using the by buy-in. Next slide, please. So this is, the first hospital founded by the Order of Franciscan Friars Minor, and this is the Hospital de Naturales. So founded in 1578, I have seen uh, websites where they always say it's founded in 1577, and uh, uh, there are conflicting data, but this is uh, clear in the Franciscan records. It was founded in 1578 by Fray Juan Clemente, a Franciscan brother, who began to accept the poor sick as they refer, they referred to these people poor sick in a little hut uh, of the porteria the porteria is the entrance to the convent and uh, later on uh, his superiors allowed him to establish a larger hut next to the hospital close by and this even though the name would be Hospital de Naturales or Hospital of the Natives, it actually was open to people of different nations. So you would have Africans. Yes, there were Africans in the Philippines at that time. Many of these were slaves brought by, by Portuguese and other Europeans 
in the Philippines, no? So you would have people from Mozambique, people from uh, uh, Western Africa, uh, and then we would have people from different parts of Asia. You would have people from Siam or what you know you call today as Thailand, and then of course the Chinese who came in large numbers to migrate to the Philippines. And then of course there were Japanese and people uh, uh, from Europe, different parts of Europe, not just Spaniards, Mexicans. There were also a certain number of Mexicans in the Philippines and of course the natives. By 1583, it had already become a 200 bed hospital. So can you imagine in a short span of time, Fray Juan Clemente was so hardworking that he was able to construct a 200 bed hospital in a span of five years. It is made of hard wood, but it was burned to the ground. However, it was rebuilt quickly, but unfortunately another fire, because there were many fires at that time, 1603, it burned down again. And, but then it also happened that the, the royal government designated the Hospital de Naturales as the hospital for contagious diseases, which included uh, leprosy. And so it had to be moved outside of Intramuros, so extra muros, meaning outside, in a place called Santa Ana, where the Franciscans were also, um, were also assigned and they had a church there. And the hospital was, was referred to by that time as Santa Ana, Hospital de Santa Ana de Dilao. No, Dilao eventually because uh, Dilao uh, because of uh, the association with the Japanese. No, because in 1632, 130 Japanese people suffering or afflicted with leprosy arrived in the Philippines because they were expelled by the shogunate of Japan, the government of Japan. Why were they expelled? Two reasons. First, because they were suffering from leprosy. And second, and more importantly, because they were all Catholics. And at that time, there was a persecution of Catholics in Japan. The Franciscans accepted the 130 Japanese uh, and um, the king even gave a special financial support specifically for the Japanese uh, suffering from leprosy. And since 1632, the name stuck to this hospital and now it would be, up to this time, it would be known as Hospital de San Lazaro, no? after the patron saint of people with leprosy. Next slide, please. So I would like to show uh, the photograph below is a, is a fairly recent photograph, meaning 20, 20th century. This is the appearance of the Church of San Francisco just before the Second World War. No? But above that is an illustration. This is part of a map that was drawn by Antonio de Rojas in the 18th century, the um, church, no? which shows the church. And like I said before, um, next to it, to the left, later on, I'll show a different map, would be um, another hospital, uh, or the Hospital de Naturales, which eventually will be referred to as the Hospital de Misericordia because it would be turned over to the Santa Mesa de Misericordia, no? the organization that supports many charitable causes in uh, Manila. And later on, it would be turned over uh, to the Brothers of San Juan de Dios to become the Hospital de San Juan de Dios, the original uh, Hospital de San Juan de Dios in Manila. No? Uh, next slide, please. This is the map which I would like to uh, show you. I have drawn a, a line, an arrow from the name. You can see number 13, San Juan de Dios. And then uh, the arrow points to the location, the actual location of San Juan de Dios, no? which at that time was uh, in the beginning, the Hospital de Naturales. And uh, across that to the right, you would find the hospital of, I mean, I'm sorry, the Church of San Francisco. And then, as I said, later on, this hospital, the Naturales, will move outside of the walls, and this will eventually become the Hospital de San Juan de Dios. So when this map was made, 
this was already the hospital of San Juan de Dios. But remember that this is originally the location of the Hospital de Naturales, later on to become the Hospital de San Lazaro. I believe that um, it is possible, if you look at the upper right side, there is a building right there, no? a large building on the upper right side. And I think it is possible that that would be the new uh, location of uh, Hospital de San Lazaro. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Okay, so by 1663, unfortunately, so you see the hospitals were not, uh, were not exempted from um, the uh, vicissitudes of the times that they were in. So in the 17th century, with the Kosinga, um, the Kosinga attack looming, this is another, just like the Hospital del Espiritu Santo, this hospital, of San Lazaro was also one of those ordered torn down by the same Governor General Sabiniano Manrique de Lara. But uh, by 1682, it was moved to Balete and uh, rebuilt there. No? This, this area of Balete, according to the national, to, to the historical marker that would be preserved in uh, San Lazaro is, was, is today, um, the campus of the Philippine Normal University, while other his other scholars would say that it is more likely the area where you find the mall of uh, uh, the mall of of Schumart SM uh, would be uh, the, another possibility of the actual relocation site of the Hospital de San Lazaro. Unfortunately, eighty years after that. When the British occupied Manila in 1762 to 1764, the uh, Franciscans were uh, requ required to move out, including all the hospitals. So the hospital was really, really affected badly by the British occupation. But then after the British left, the Franciscans went back and uh, recovered and re began to operate the hospital again. But the problem did not stop there. 1783, in this year, another order to destroy it, to suppress it, because the, the royal government found out that it was so close to, uh, or it is within the range. It is within the range of the batteries, the cannons of Intramuros. And if they fired uh, any of the cannons in case of war, in case of revolts, uh, then uh, the hospital would be hit, and so it was ordered to be uh, destroyed and relocated. So the next, uh, so by by uh, that time, uh, the re the hospital was reconstructed towards um, uh, by 1783. You no, know, it was suppressed and moved to what we call today as my Halige in Santa Cruz. That I believe. The street is still existing, no? The name uh, exists uh, in as a name of a street, Mayhalige. Um, and uh, the former building, former house of the Jesuits there, as well as the haciendas, were turned over. All of these were turned over to the Franciscans. And so Hospital de San Lazaro lived again. It was reconstructed in 1784, where it remains up to this time, no? However, a, a very many, many strong earthquakes visited the Philippines, but in 1882 in particular, the whole hospital, a large portion of the hospital, the church, the convent, and parts of the hospital were severely damaged by the earthquake. But fortunately enough, the director at that time is the very well-known Father Felix de Huerta, who, whose name uh, is again associated with a specific street in Manila, but I think they made a mistake because they put the name as Felix Huertas with an S, when actually the name is Felix de Huerta without the S. So it was restored by this indefatigable Franciscan director of the hospital. But then again, in 1898, during the Philippine-American War, the American, the American Army, the US Army occupied it and did not allow the Franciscans to take it back. And so uh, it was never, never returned. 
to the Franciscans. And by the year 1906, the Archbishop of Manila, who was an American, turned it over to the American government. The American government did not want to let it go. And so eventually, when independence came for us, uh, on July 4, 1946, the Philippine government inherited San Lazaro. That's why it has become a government hospital. That's the story behind that, no? And it still exists. San Lazaro has a new building, but next slide, please. I'd like to show that within the area of uh, San Lazaro would be the ruins of the, of the old hospital. I'm glad they did not take this down and they even put you know, uh, uh, a kind of um, chapel in the lower portion of the ruins. And so, and there is a marker no, here, a historical marker. And this is what, uh, uh, this is what the ruins look like today. At least there would be some uh, representation of what the original San Lazaro was. Next slide, please. So what is the legacy of San Lazaro? Definitely, definitely. We must remember the Franciscans offered everything gratis et amore, with uh, free and with love, no? Free medicine, free services, no? Not just that, but the, but the attention that they gave to the patients. They accepted every person who would be in need of patient or medical care regardless of his status, gender, age, religion, and race. It didn't make a difference. You are in need of uh, medical attention, then therefore you are accepted. We must also remember that San Lazaro is the first leprosarium in this part of the world, the first. First ahead of not only countries of Southeast Asia, but even Japan and even parts of China. And what I mean by leprosarium is, of course, patterned after the Western leprosarium no, in Europe. Now, what is, I think, the most significant is the presentation of the Franciscan paradigm. What do I mean by this? The Franciscans uh, created a paradigm that was holistic. And so when I was listening earlier to the, to the, to the clips, to the doc, to the documentaries uh, you uh, showed, I was very happy because it you, uh, the word holistic was mentioned. And that was exactly what the Franciscans did. They created a holistic system of attending to the, to the people afflicted with leprosy. They did not only attend to the physical needs or the medical needs of these people. No, they, the, the wounds were washed, they were cleaned they were bound, no? Bandages were put around them. If they needed one Japanese who was almost close to the point of death, requested the Franciscan uh, brother to bring him to the church because he could not walk. And he, the Franciscan brother actually carried him and brought him to the church to hear mass, to make a confession and then afterwards, he cleaned uh, the, the Japanese uh, patient and cut all his nails. And the, the description is very, very graphic in the records. And, and uh, many of the several historians mentioned that the Franciscans looked upon uh, the people afflicted with leprosy as actually people with the wounds of our Lord Jesus Christ. And not only that, it doesn't stop there because this is only the physical or the medical side, but they all were also concerned about the psychological health of the patients. They allowed the, the patients who did not have serious uh, uh, um, cases of uh, the disease to live in a fenced in area beside the hospital. So they built a community right next to the hospital where they were allowed to build their houses, to tend their own gardens, so and then to earn a living, no matter how limited. They were allowed to plant uh, vegetables and rice, and if they had excess uh, amounts, they're allowed to sell them within the community, or they were also allowed to weave textiles and sell them outside. 
to uh of the community so they, by in this way they were able to uh, they were able to develop a better self esteem they were able to have uh um you know uh um more or less family life because they were also allowed to marry and have children and and this is this is unheard of at that time no to have to allow um the people afflicted with leprosy to establish a family to get married because this this are not allowed before these people were rejected by society they were abandoned by their own families but the franciscans they allowed these people to establish homes and then to develop uh to develop a means to sustain themselves to earn a small income and even establish their families but more important than that they address the spiritual needs of these people and so every every day there are masses that would be uh uh said for them people who would be at the point of death because some of the cases were actually very uh very serious um those who are close to the to death would be given uh would be uh comforted and uh they, they make sure that the person would have a good death no in that in that sense and then um all the other requirements if they have children they need to be baptized they are baptized if if they want to marry then uh, they are uh, they are they are married and uh and if they and someone dies then they are also buried so this is the holistic paradigm that the franciscans started even before the coming of the americans i'd like to state that so it antedates the american model by more than a hundred years excuse me because i think um it is not yet very well understood uh that this holistic uh model has been practiced by the franciscan since the beginning of the 19th century 1802 no 1802 it was already there no and even even earlier than that i believe uh towards the end of the 18th century since the estab the re-establishment of the hospital de san lazaro in my Halige, because there was enough space to construct the houses of um the patients then uh this was already taking place no? next slide please very closely associated with the hospitals of course would be the medical and surgical practice and even the pharmaceutical practice which i shall explain later on now this part of franciscan history is again very little known from the 16th to the 18th centuries this is the most active period of the so-called medicos cirujanos or what would be called doctor surgeons no? who would be making uh, made up of basically lay franciscan brothers no these brothers are not really trained in medicine or surgery before they became to the before they arrived in the philippines before they came here but when they arrived they would be um asked where uh they would like uh there would be uh there would be some um consultation if they are interested in serving in the hospitals and if they are serious about it, then they would undergo a spe uh, specific training under senior Franciscan medico cirujanos in the Royal Hospital. No, so therefore the Royal Hospital uh, became some sort of a medical college training the Franciscan uh, medico cirujanos or doctor surgeons who are not really doctors or surgeons but are trained. Uh, by that, why is this? Why was this done? Because of the severe lack of doctors and surgeons at that time, especially in the early in the early uh, centuries of the Spanish colonization, there were hardly any doctors, and the reports were very very dire, very bad. People died simply because there were no doctors at all, and so the Franciscan order did not just s stay. Uh, uh, sit by without doing anything. They actually trained uh, the Franciscan brothers who were interested in becoming medico cirujanos 
they were trained to become so. And because of this, because of their kindness, because of their attention to the patients, this resulted in many conversions. Actually, many natives were uh, touched by the service uh, given by the Franciscan brothers. But unfortunately, together with this, uh, together with this uh, distinct distinction, they also attracted criticism and controversy. Uh, there were there were some attempts. Actually, um, some of them became uh, became successful. Uh, there were attempts to take over their hospitals, and actually, that 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 really happened. But fortunately, in the case of San Lazaro, the Franciscans managed to hold on to San Lazaro all the way up to the end of the Spanish colonial period, but only to finally lose it to the Americans. Huh? However, these Franciscan brothers never gave up um, the service to the sick, the ministry of the sick. They persisted in this. And so all the way up to the 18th century, but then uh, towards the 19th century, the, the latter part of the 18th century, there were very few few uh, lay brothers. And uh, since the hospitals of the Franciscans were also lost, only uh, San Lazaro was uh, the one that remained. Uh, there uh, was less demand for them. And eventually, this um, whole idea of training medicos y rojanos eventually died out. And so it is a very little known aspect of Franciscan history, even within the order according to one Franciscan historian, even within the order itself, very few actually uh, remember the involvement in medicine and surgery of the Franciscans in the Philippines. But the natives seeing all of this done by the Franciscans um, inspired them to donate more to the hospitals, which explained the persistence or the survival of the hospitals throughout the centuries, despite and in spite the great challenges and threats that were that they faced. Um, next slide, please. So, Father, in the words of Father John Schumacher, in his one of his articles and readings in Philippine Church History, he said, "Not only, and I quote, not only did the sick receive help and comfort." But the living witness of unselfish charity of the friars was often more powerful than any sermon or instruction for making Christ known. I could not have put it more eloquently. Next slide, please. So in this map, this is the same map I used earlier, but this time, if you look at the lower, uh, uh, lower left, left of center, you would find the arrow that points to the whole complex of the Hospital Real, number nine. No? You would see Hospital Real. So this is the place where the Medicos y Rojanos were trained many years by senior, by senior uh, Franciscans, Franciscan Medicos y Rojanos. I'd like to give some examples. For example, some of the well-known uh, Franciscan lay brothers who became Medico Cirujanos is the famous Juan Clemente that founded uh, Hospital de Naturales or the Hospital de San Lazaro. Then we have Father Fray Blas de Madre de Dios, who would become a very well-known pharmacist. I will, I will go to, I will discuss him a little later. And then, of course, the famous founder of several hospitals, Fray Diego de Santa Maria the founder of the Hospital del Espiritu Santo, the founder of the Hospital de Agua Santas in Los Baños, and the founder of the hospital um, of the Franciscans Internate Indonesia. Huh? So that's another part that is so interesting because he had gone to many places and everywhere he went, he founded hospitals. Huh? And then those um, medicos cirujanos or the lay brothers who were trained by a senior um, Franciscan uh, medico cirujano or, or doctor surgeon would be one example is Fray Antonio de la Concepcion, 
who would be trained by the famous Fray Blas Garcia. And then another one is, of course, Fray Andres San Diego, who would be trained by the very well known Father Jose de Valencia, who I will discuss uh, next. Um, next slide, please. So I now come to pharmacopoeia, the collection of uh, uh, the practice of pharmacy, you know, administering uh, drugs, uh, medicines in the right amount, the dosage, etc. And this obviously was and introduce the Western uh, uh, practice of medicine and Western medicines themselves were introduced and used in the Philippines as early as the 16th century. But then, as you all know, even if there are hospitals, even if there are doctors, and there are very few doctors, but if there is no medicine, then all of this would be for nothing. Because the reality was that the medicines were perennially lacking. They were not there. Why? Because if the medicines came from Spain, how long would it take to come to the Philippines? At least, least three years, if they come at all. Because it doesn't follow that if they are shipped from Spain, that they would actually arrive in the Philippines. So many things can happen uh, from Spain all the way to the Philippines. If the medicines come from Mexico, you would say, well, it's closer. Oh, yeah, it's closer. But you have the great expanse of the Pacific Ocean that separates the Philippines from Mexico. And so even if the medicines were loaded in the galleons, the galleons could sink. The galleons could, uh, many have sunk, actually, and were never found. Then you would have galleons that were hijacked by uh, the British. The British captured several of them and all the riches aboard. No? And of course, you would also have uh, uh, the fact that uh, the, the galleon would be there, but the people would be killed by hostile natives of the different islands where they would stop over or would be uh, accidentally uh, um, directed to. So, um, the reality was that there were no medicines. And so what did the Franciscans do? They did, again, they did not simply sit there and do nothing. They decided to turn to traditional herbal medicine. They noticed that many of the natives had cures for, you know, pains, aches, certain ailments. And so they did research. They asked those who have knowledge about this to accompany them. And so you would have two very important Franciscans, no? Father Blas Madre de Dios and Father Jose de Valencia, Fray Jose de Valencia, who would go to the mountains. No? They lived in two different periods, but I put their name side by side because both of them contributed greatly to pharmacopoeia, the knowledge of uh, traditional herbal medicine they collected um, plants, leaves, roots, seeds, what have you, and tested them all, described them, collected them, and wrote them down, wrote the beneficial results or the possible cures of the particular root or seed or fruit, even vegetables. And so both these uh, two uh, uh, Franciscans, Fray Blasma de Madre de Dios and Fray Jose de Valencia collected or uh, uh, produced some of the most important um, data regarding uh, pharmacopoeia, uh, traditional herbal medicine from uh, um, plants, uh, both introduced and native to the Philippines. Why did I say introduced? Because some of them were actually introduced from Mexico and Latin America. The Spaniards introduced many of these in the Philippines. No? And some of those medicines, some types of medicines that were produced would come from coconut. No? Definitely coconut. Uh, the oil can be, uh, oil can also be made into a lotion. Um, and then put on uh, sores, put on wounds, no? and they were said to be quite effective. The same for tobacco. Tobacco would be uh, uh, introduced to the Philippines. It came from the Caribbean, 
but then it was made into a poultice and then applied on the wounds. The same for honey, which can be applied directly on the wound or ingested or taken. No? Uh, and I'm sure some of you are familiar with nyok nyogan. This is uh, up to now. Some people have told me, yes, nyok nyogan is, is uh, known to have curative uh, um, uh, qualities. And of course, uh, langka, no? jackfruit, which according to the document I saw, was powdered, was made, was, was con converted into a powder put in a bag. And then I think it was Father Jose de Valencia who sprinkled it on the wounds of a uh, man whose leg uh, was, uh, had festering wounds, very deep wounds. And then the Spanish doctor said, this leg should be amputated because it's, it's not getting better. But Father, but Fry Jose de Valencia sprinkled the powder of, of jackfruit and the wounds healed. So these are only some of them. But unfortunately, many of this, uh, this, this collection, this data would be unknown uh, because many of the works of, especially the work of Father Fray Jose de Valencia, now uh, we do not have a copy of the book. There is no extant copy because of the very popularity, because it was said that Fray Jose de Valencia um, uh, wrote down the information and had very good results. So he decided to uh, reproduce uh, the book, recopied. No? So he made many copies of that and gave them away to people, to anybody who would be interested, foreigners who came to the Philippines, to natives who would be looking for a, a solution to their aches and pains. And so probably the popularity um, contributed to its not being preserved. So we don't have a copy of that. No? Next slide, please. However, we do have the copy, not we, but I mean, the Archivo Franciscano Ibero Americano in Madrid has the, a preserved copy of the Libro de Medicinas Caseras para Consuelo de los Religiosos, etc., etc., by Fray, uh, muy reverendo Fray Blas de Madre de Dios, no, in 1611. So very, very important. I don't think this was published at all. So it would be very important, uh, I think, if, um, if I would be able to go back and... Uh, copy the entire manuscript and have, have this published and then uh, printed finally so that people would know what, not only what he did, but how he used uh, the knowledge of the natives and uh, um, shared it with as many people as possible, therefore giving, uh, giving a consolation and helping people uh, to be relieved of the pains and aches that they suffered from. Next slide, please. So we have, what then do we, did the Philippine Catholic Church derive or what is the legacy of the Franciscans to the Philippine Catholic Church? There are several. The hospitals, the medical and patient care that was exhibited, that was practiced here, were the real, real life examples of the basic teachings of Christianity that the natives actually experienced. So for many of them, the concept of equality was very clear. Equality because it didn't matter whether you are a native, you are a Christian, even non-Christians, Muslims were taken in and cured, no? and, and then given, uh, given uh, the necessary uh, medical attention. That's what I meant. No? So it didn't matter. So. Uh, the concept of equality, treating uh, your neighbor as yourself, definitely. This was very clear to the natives. And since the, the hospitals were, were introduced quite early in the 16th century, then the natives began to develop this whole and appreciate this, uh, this uh, living the faith no? every day in the hospitals. And this resulted into many conversions, adherence, and this converts um, were, were very imp important because they were, they played an important role in getting more natives 
to be converted, especially if the native who was converted would be a local leader, if he would be um, a uh, um, alakan. So he would be able to influence the people uh, whom uh, he would have um, influence over. And so by 1650, this is the middle of the 17th century, you would have the faith, the Christian uh, Christianity uh, blossoming, starting to grow. No, the Filipinos would be uh, more familiar with what uh, Christian life is. And many of them have actually become serious about it enough for uh, the Beaterios, for the women. Actually, Father Schumacher says the women took the first initiative to establish the Beaterios, to live uh, amongst themselves and to devote their life to prayer uh, and uh, to God and doing uh, good things to their fellow uh, men. And then, of course, a little later on, towards the end of the 17th century, by 1690, you would have the first students, first native students in the Colegio de San Juan de Letran, in the Colegio de Santo Tomas, even in the Colegio de uh, San Jose of the Jesuits. And eventually some of these uh, first students also went on to become the first native secular priests. So by uh, the beginning of the 18th century, we already had secular priests. And all the more so by the 19th century when uh, uh, the, the faith was firmly established and have fully matured, no? according to Father Schumacher. So, um, and what about the nation? Next slide, please. For the Filipino nation, there are also things that we take away that we benefit from the Franciscans, no? that we got from the Franciscans. First would be, again, the hospitals produced or made the natives experience uh, the whole idea of equality, as I said before. And of course, equality would also mean justice, fairness, to be treated fairly. No? And not only that, but the hospitals, because they, they accepted people from different places, from different provinces, not just in the Tagalog area. You know uh, that uh, um, the records would say that they came from all parts of the islands, the different islands. And so some from the Visayas, some from the north, some from central Luzon, some from the Bicol area. And this gave the natives, because the largest beneficiaries of the hospitals and the uh, medicine and the uh, pharmacy uh, um, would be uh, the natives. And because of that, the sense of integration would develop amongst us. Integration, we would know that we are all different, that we did not speak the same language. We spoke different languages, but we belonged to, uh, to a community, a, a common Christian religion that united us, and that was very important. The hospitals also gave the natives the opportunity to serve in, in many different ways, not just, uh, not just as soldiers or as farmers, but they realized that serving others is an important way of honoring, uh, of, of uh, becoming of service um, to the community. And so some of them served in the hospitals some of them became clerks because the hospitals needed clerks in the offices to record the patients, to record uh, the illnesses, to record uh, the finances. So this opened up different opportunities for the natives. But most importantly to me, what I see is that this gave rise to a consciousness a way of thinking amongst the natives that they belong not just to a community, a community of Christians, but also to a country. It became clear that the many different islands would be governed by one, uh, one, one entity, and this was Filipinas. And this is the imagined community of a nation becoming. No? So to me, this is very important. No? 
but it doesn't stop here it is not just the filipino church the philippine church and the filipino nation that had an important uh take away from uh from uh the experience last and uh, the next slide please it went beyond because for the franciscans themselves what happened, the, the order itself, what happened, the unique Philippine experience that they had gave them a greater capacity and a greater uh, greater potential uh, that they used when they became actively involved in the evangelization of Japan, China, Anam and Tonkin, which is today, which are today referred to as Vietnam. They also introduced the hospital system in these areas. The first leprosaria, you know that the first leprosaria in Japan was in Kyoto, and then in Nagasaki, and these were founded by Franciscans. This again is not yet very well known. And of course, the Philippine pharmacopoeia, the knowledge, the invaluable uh, knowledge of the medicinal qualities of the herbs and uh, plants, proved to be very, very uh, important in the missions abroad. No? Even though some of them would not be available, some plants and roots would not be available there, but they adapted no? uh, the use um, of uh, local plants, uh, herbs, to the different environments where they found themselves. So to me, it is fitting and fair. It is fitting and fair to resurrect all of these indelible contributions of the Franciscans uh, as we celebrate the 500th anniversary of the coming of Christianity to the Philippines. Our story would not be complete without explaining the Franciscan legacies. So thank you very much. Next slide, please. So that is, these are my sources. Another slide would be my sources. And then uh, last one, this, this is all, that is all. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Michael and Spice. And again, thank you so much to Dr. Maria Loisa de Castro. This is a very comprehensive and very insightful uh, uh, research that you uh, did there, ma'am. No? Siguro ako to, to start po, no? um, if, if, if I may, no? there, there seems to be a theme arising from this that you know franciscans will build something and then it's going to serve a lot of people but there would be some kind of a say disaster or there would some be untoward incident that will you know erase it erase it um was this something would you say was this something beyond the franciscans control was there something that could they have done in order to prevent uh, these, these because these are good these are very good contributions and and it's it's quite um sad <laughs> uh, to, to to hear that you know uh bigla na lang po itong nawala dahil sa mga hindi inaasang pangyayari yeah uh, thank you very much for uh, that question actually uh totoo yan totoo yang sinabi mo there are many things actually it's both uh, there are things that were beyond the control of the Franciscans, but there are also things that they were able uh, to address. For example, um, number one, natural disasters would be way beyond the control of the Franciscans. So this does not uh, include only earthquakes. I mentioned earthquakes, but you all know that there are typhoons. There would be flooding. Uh, there would be fires. No, And there, of course, uh, um, not, not just natural disasters, but human disasters, no? the revolts, no? the Chinese revolt, several Chinese revolts, serious enough uh, to make the, the Spanish government uh, uh, consider uh, giving uh, the Pampangos, uh, the, the, the soldiers they recruited from Pampanga, the assignment of guarding uh, Intramuros because there are very few Spaniards in uh, the Philippines throughout the entire Spanish colonial period. And if they would be all killed, then naturally the Spanish colonial uh, government will cease to exist. But the natives, it's very clear that uh, natives also supported the Spaniards in this endeavor. And the support is not, polit not just political, I think, because of, uh, because of the faith, because of 
they share the same religion. Now, the other aspects which cannot be controlled by the Franciscans would be war, war versus of Spain versus other European countries, like, for example, the occupation of the British, the British occupation of Manila was, was beyond their control. And then, of course, you would have uh, the attempts of the British to capture the galleons. Marami silang Nakuha, uh, several, and that's the reason why a large number of them became extreme, so wealthy that they retired from, uh, from their work and lived for the rest of their lives enjoying the wealth that they got from the galleons, from hijacking or capturing the galleons. Ngayon, anong ginawa ng mga Franciscans? They simply did not give up. They did not give up. They continued. They continued to solicit donations. Uh, there are times when there were no, there was no help coming from Mexico or coming from uh, Spain. It is so easy to say that the galleons went back and forth from Acapulco to Manila, but the reality is that there were many years when there were no galleons at all. And so if the galleons did not come, there would be no situado. What is the situado? This is the assistance given by uh, Mexico to the Philippines because the Philippine government is always short of funding so the, the the mexico has to give an annual subsidy to the philippines no to help the government so if the galleon doesn't arrive you can imagine the disastrous effects of this and so many of the hospitals i have read uh, documents that say so many young men are dying because there is no help. There is no help coming from Spain. There is no help from Mexico. So please, they always say, please, please send help as soon as possible. But when you say, please send help, it will take years because, you know, as I've said before, the average uh, length of time for a letter to come from Spain to the Philippines is three years at best, no? And it can even take longer. That's the reason why some letters arrive addressed to someone who is no longer there. He had died because of the length of time. It took so long for the letters to arrive that uh, the person had already died. And so without help, with very little money, what did they do? They tightened their belts. That's why I admire the Franciscan so much. I have. That's the reason why I decided to do this work because uh, uh, many of them persisted in the work even with so much, uh, so much opposition, not just from uh, local, uh, the local, uh, I mean, uh, not local government, but from the royal government itself, but also from other, uh, other religious orders. I don't want to, uh, to mention it, but there was uh, controversy between uh, one, between uh, one religious order and another because the the claim uh, was that the Franciscans are is uh, is not a religious order that was founded specifically to administer hospitals, and so their qualification to be medico cirujanos qualification to administer hospitals is questioned was questioned very very seriously but did they give up no they did not give up they simply went on with humility with the same uh, service for others and so you have the living testimony to this is the continued existence of the hospital de san lazaro so i oh, hope i answered your question. Yes. yes. It's a very nice uh, you know, as it's a very nice way to look at things, you know, because you can you can say na ah, nakakalungkot naman, but but here you are ma'am, you're saying that it only made the Franciscans resilient yes. to, to 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 you have to have more fortitude, should I say? Yeah, fortitude, exactly. Yes. That's the word. Yes, in times you? of you know, in times of difficulties, and, and yes. uh, that's why uh, you know it's a very very uh, should I say very nice day, very blessed day to to learn about these uh, things, this display of fortitude uh, and resilience. And uh, uh, right now we are uh, getting uh, uh, messages uh, from uh, our members of the audience. We have. Uh, 
our Jean Clasara, an alumnus of the University of Santo Tomas, uh, saying thank you, ma'am, for this wonderful lecture. We have John Brian Cabahog, also from USD, USC History Society. Uh, he would like to ask, do the Franciscans, in whatever way, uh, have they collaborated with the Dominicans in Santo Tomas for the formation and perhaps, you know, instruction, teaching of the Faculty of Medicine uh, and Pharmacy in 1871? Um, my answer to that is actually no, because by 1871, that was already quite a late, uh, that was a very late period. By 1871, only San Lazaro was left uh, of the different from the different hospitals which they have founded, and by 1871 there were no more uh, medicos cirujanos or the the lay uh, Franciscan brothers. Remember what I said before that the most active period of these lay brothers who became uh, medicos cirujanos would be the 16th to the 18th centuries, and so by the 19th century there was really very little and that's why according to father severiano alcobendas who is a franciscan historian he said even in the memory of the franciscan order uh this part of franciscan history has actually been forgotten that's why he wrote about the medico cirujanos uh, this was early in the 1920s and i was very fortunate enough to be able to come across the, the writing of Father Alcobenda. So that made me pursue the investigation more in order to be able to find out uh, about, more about the hospitals because I had a personal interest in that because of my connections to Cavite Puerto. Wow, very wonderful. All right, I, we, uh, uh, John, we hope uh, that uh, uh, Dr. Degasha has answered your question. Uh, the question from uh, our Jean, uh, the alumnus from USD is, are there any, because, uh, and I guess this is a very uh, good question because as we know, St. Francis of Assisi, the patron saint of, of the Franciscans, is a patron saint of ecology. So you see the association between, you know, uh, uh, the Franciscans using nature in order to heal. So the question now is, are there any existing sources at this uh, today or at, at present on the extent of the native assistance or collaboration in the Franciscans efforts to use traditional herbal medicine in their hospitals? And uh, actually it's, it's uh, two, uh, parang pinagsamang dalawang tanong. Did the Franciscans also introduce something novel in the use of uh, these medicines, which may qualify the practice of pharmacopoeia as hybrid or Creole? Actually, that's a good question. Thank you very much, Arjean. Oh, thank you very much for the question. But actually, Franciscan records are uh, very well known for not having many details because of the, you know, um, um, I don't know, but this even, even the Franciscan historians say that, that there is very little specific details that would be given uh, by by many of them, and so the mention is in general form that it is with the assistance of herbolarios or natives who are unnamed. I wish that there is at least one name that we could give, but I have not come across any. But uh, these are native uh, herbalists whom they uh, they uh, requested to help them, and they were enthusiastic enough to bring. Uh, the Franciscan lay brother interested in uh, the, the traditional medicine, uh, the plants and, and all other, all those things to uh, forest, uh, for the fastnesses of the mountains, the valleys, the, the you know, uh, whenever Father Fray Jose de Valencia was free, meaning he was not busy in any of his duties, that is what he did. He went up in the mountains in the forest with the native um, helpers who taught him he learned directly from them and so um i'm sorry i cannot give any names because the records are also silent on them but it doesn't reduce the native contribution to the knowledge of pharmacopoeia any less they are both the natives and the franciscans are both both uh um, both deserve recognition for all 
uh, the things that they have done, especially because the greatest beneficiaries of this would be none other than the natives themselves. Yeah, so we have uh, uh, a minute left. Okay, we have a minute left for the open forum. Siguro ma'am, uh, last question. Uh, because, uh, you know, a lot of the Franciscans' work was really directed towards the natives, people who might not be in the center, they might be the ones in the peripheries, if I'm not mistaken. How does this, um, or maybe I guess the proper wording should be, what should we learn now as citizens of today? We have an election coming up and, you know, as we know, there are politicians already, you know, courting us, the people, the voters, the electorate uh, for our votes. Um, what uh, kind of lesson are the, our Franciscan forebearers teaching us when it comes to choosing our next leaders? Um, that is actually a difficult question to answer, but I will try my best to answer that no but clearly the from not uh not just the franciscans themselves but this whole process of how did i manage to get all of this information to be able to share to you today and that it's very clear that what i said many of the things or practically everything that i said would be evidence-based and so if there is anything that we could learn from the franciscan experience in the past it is that everything that we should believe in must be based on evidence. It cannot be imagined. It cannot be based on lies. It cannot be based only on what they say because this is not the way uh, it should be. The historical methodology is evidence-based. And so we have to look, we should have critical thinking. I think the Franciscans were critically we're critical thinkers to the point that they realize that we cannot simply wait for the assistance coming from Spain if ever it would arrive at all. We should do something here and now. And this is what opened their minds to the possibility of tapping local knowledge of medicine, herb, herbal herbs and plants. And that has made a great difference in um, in uh, serving uh, the sick, the poor, uh, furthering the ministry of the sick. And I think more than anything else, I think that is what uh, we should uh, remember that, um, that uh, the Franciscans stood for humility, stood for humility, not for self aggrandizement and promoting of the self. So I think the message is clear. <laughs> the, the, the Franciscans showed us the way, the early Franciscans showed us the way. So choose the leader who would be able to really make a difference, who speaks the truth, who does not say or make claims that are all untrue. Because the truth, because Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And I think the best example would be the early Franciscans themselves. Well said. Thank you very much, Dr. De Castro, Dr. Maria Eloisa De Castro, for joining us. We truly appreciate your time with us. Pax et bon. I had a very, very good time. I would like to thank uh, the administration, the ELIP, the organizing committee, all the attendees today, all my students who came. Um, and I am humbled by this uh, opportunity to share my research to the Franciscan community. Thank you very much.